So in today's uh, lecture, we are going to talk about network virtualization. Uh, but before we start, I just want to have some discussions about, you know, what we have covered so far, and uh, you know, like some questions that some of you might have uh, regarding the term projects, uh, because the proposal for term projects are coming close. I haven't heard any, <laughs> you know, like anything from you folks about like, you know, what are your plans? Uh, where are you struggling? Is everything sorted out? Uh, so maybe we can have some quick discussion on that topic before we dig into the topic of network virtualization. Any questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself. There are not too many students online right now, so it's totally okay if you want to speak up. Okay, so I didn't hear anything. <laughs> so let me ask you folks uh, specific questions, right? So have you all decided uh, what project you'll be working on for the term? term? Okay, no, 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 okay, no, okay. Uh, so what is, what is your strategy? Uh, because it's not too far, right? So there's still some time left, but I'm just curious, like, you know, what is the strategy you folks have? Like, are you planning to read some papers and decide uh, what you want to implement for your term project? You want to do something new? Uh, what is what, what is the plan? How can I help? Okay. <laughs> No chatter here. Uh, okay, some, okay. <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, so are, are you aware of the deadline uh, for project submission uh, or like the, pro the proposal submission? Let me open up the website, make sure that I have all the information up there. Okay, so the project proposal is due on February 5th. So there is still a lot of time here. Like I'm not saying that uh, you know anybody is running late here, uh, but I think because this is a bit of a different type of term project, uh, so I'm just curious that you know uh, is there any uh, you know like any approach that you folks have figured out that you are going to apply uh, to you know understand what type of papers you're trying to uh, you know like select for this reproducibility part. Uh, because there is also, uh, you know, aspect where you can do a new project of your own. Uh, but either way, I think like you probably want to run it with us, uh, like in the teaching staff, either me or with the TAs to figure out, you know, like whether that project is within the scope of things that are uh, expected for this course, right? Uh, uh, I guess like there's also this part and concern that some of you have about the team work here, right? Because uh, you know, you can work in team uh, for this project, uh, but I think like, you know, with this remote setup, it's really hard uh, to get going with the team thing. So, you know, like I, I'm just here to, before I start teaching network virtualization, I'm just trying to understand where we all stand. Are, are there any concerns? Are you feeling underprepared, overprepared? Uh, is, is the lecture kind of like helping you understand the software defined networking? Yes, no, you know, like those type of questions. Okay, so so Kyle is saying that maybe uh, we can present, give you an example uh, paper that would make a good project. So that is something that we are planning to cover uh, for next discussion section. Uh, so in the next discussion section, we'll be covering a project called Jellyfish, uh, which was you know developed for data center networks, and uh, uh, and maybe maybe a related question is like how many of you are actually attending or checking out the lectures or the videos that we are posting for the discussion section. I mean, like it's a live session, 
but the teaching staff reported that my, many students are not really joining. And that's something that I observed that, you know, that's also happening uh, for my office hours as, as well. Like nobody's really showing up for the office hours. So we are a bit concerned. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like those concerns are also coming from the fact that we're not really seeing each other in person, right? Like if, if you were regularly interacting in person in the classrooms, we probably don't have this type of communication gap, right? So I'm just trying to understand, like, you know, maybe first thing uh, you can answer, uh, any of you attending discussion section, have you checked the first discussion section? Okay. Okay, so you have checked the recordings. I think like as long as you have checked the recordings, that's totally fine. So you understand how Mininet really works, uh, what are the underlying principles and uh, how can you use it for your own uh, requirements, right? Because the next, like, you know, this discussion section will be focusing on uh, using an open flow controller, uh, either Nox or Fox, uh, to show you how you can, you know, like uh, program uh, open flow switch to write basic programs uh, for software defined networking, right? Uh, but I think like in the next discussion section, which will be next week, I will encourage most of you to attend or, uh, you know, join that discussion where the teaching staff is going to show you how uh, we can, you know, like pick a research paper and then use the tools that we have at our disposal right now uh, to do this reproducibility of some of these research results, right? Uh, I would, you know, like maybe uh, like later next week might be a good time. Maybe my office hours uh, next week will be a good time for all of us to converge and see if that helped. If not, then maybe you can provide us feedback, you know, like what else can we do uh, to make you feel more prepared for, uh, you know, taking on these term projects, right? Uh, the goal, like, you know, like the way we have structured this course is that uh, I'm trying to teach the high level principles and abstractions as much as possible in these lectures so that you have this overview of what is software defined networking, where different pieces of research, uh, you know, fit in the spectrum of different work that has been done in this space. Uh, but with the discussion section, we're trying to make it a bit more hands-on uh, so that you understand, you know, like how can you write a uh, simple Python program that can, you know, like arbitrarily create different types of uh, topologies. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I think like some of, uh, so it, there is that conflict between what it says on gold versus what, what we have converged. And this is something because gold is something uh, not very up to date. And like, you know, gold didn't ask me about uh, what is the right time for setting up the request section. Uh, but I have uh, teaching staff, uh, one of them is sitting in South Africa, so I have to figure out a schedule that works for everybody else. So that's why I think, you know, uh, we have, like earlier we had two discussion sections, one each of the teaching staff was taking, but like since no, like, you know, very few of you are showing up. So we decide that, you know, if it has to be recorded, then we can just have one recording. So we have converged that on Thursday, uh, I, I guess it's 9 to 9.50 a.m. Uh, PT. Uh, and that is a time that works uh, for both the teaching staff uh, because one of them is in South Africa right now. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, and, and those those will be recorded. So you will have access to those videos uh, and then you will be able like, you know, and then we have these two hours of uh, office hours as well uh, for both the teaching staff and I have an hour of the office hour. So if you have any questions, concerns about uh, these, uh, you know, like problems or uh, programs that we are covering in the discussion section, you should feel free to reach out to us and you like uh, come up, show up for the office hours and we'll be more than happy to walk you through uh, like challenges that you're facing, right? But I would emphasize that given that the majority of the uh, points for this course will be earned you, via this term project. So I would say like, you know, take it more seriously uh, and uh, ask questions, right? Like if you, if anything is not clear, so you, some of you already pointed out, that we should give you an overview of how that can be done. So that's something which uh, we already planned for and like, you know, that will start next week. Uh, so, you know, uh, that will be a good start, but I think like, you know, by end of next week, uh, you can give us feedback that whether that was sufficient, if not, then we can provide you uh, more examples of how things can be done. But we also want to cover, you know, like other, so, you know, like uh, we also want to expose you to the uh, P4 language, uh, which you know we've briefly covered the data plane targets, the easy, the reconfigurable match action tables, so the PSA targets. So the programming language to program that is called P4, and we will be covering a bunch of examples or a bunch of discussion sections uh, dedicated on P4, so that you have some hands-on experience with that language as well. And think of that as uh, you know like 
a hardware language because we are programming a hardware target and we are expressing the behavior that it should exhibit. Uh, but then you will see how the, that kind of like programmability helps you uh, write different types of network uh, applications uh, and you know like people have built systems around it. So we will be covering those systems in the lecture, but I think you like you will be getting some hands on experience with P4 and then the two programming assignments that we have uh, will be both, uh, you know, like we leveraging P4 a lot in that. So we are also trying to, you know, like run some discussion section so that you have exposure to how to use P4 for writing different programs. Uh, then we'll give you some pointers on like, you know, what other examples that you can look up to. Uh, and then you'll, you can work on the programming assignments as well that are related to P4. Any questions regarding any of things, any of the things that I said? So there are, I, I think the, uh, the website clarifies there are two uh, programming assignments that will be graded. Uh, there is the assignment zero, uh, which is just setting up the VM. So th that is an ungraded thing, but that will set up the environment for you so that you can complete the two assignments. So assignment zero, I think like, you know, uh, it's almost complete. Uh, we are just, you know, uh, in the final phase of releasing it, we are uh, we had some uh, issues because you know one of the teaching staff, as I mentioned, was in South Africa, and uh, sometimes you know like testing these assignments requires uh, downloading a VM, uh, which, which can be problematic uh, depending on what type of network access we have. So it's getting delayed. Uh, we were planning to release it early this week, uh, but you know you should expect it to be released either later today or tomorrow. And. I would repeat that assignment zero is not graded. It will just provide you instructions so that you can set up the environment, which will be useful for you to work with assignment one. And assignment one, we, we are planning uh, to release it by end of next week, uh, but maybe, uh, you know, like we might need one more weekend to, you know, iron it out. Yeah, I, I think like, you know, uh, for what it's worth, uh, I can give you an overview of uh, what those assignments are going to look like uh, so that you, don't have too much of uncertainties about what we're doing, but I, I think like, you know, for us, it is exciting, but at the same time, it is also challenging uh, to create new programming assignments. Uh, you know, uh, I don't want to set up a, uh, you know, example where we just copy paste programming assignments from some other place. So we are, we are doing cutting edge research on these topics. So we are also capable of creating new programming assignments that have clear learning objectives that will be useful for you. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it takes some time uh, to finalize all these things and like make sure that there is minimal confusion at your end. Uh, so we are in the process of you know like finalizing assignment one as well. And as I said, like we will we will be targeting uh, end of next week to release that uh, programming assignment. At a high level, the goal will be that you know uh, we will be you know like walking you through how you can use a set of uh, programmable switches to set up a environment where you're running uh, video streaming sessions, right? And then we will guide you that, you know, what type of approach or what type of uh, metrics can be collected? Uh, what is the pipeline of workflow for collecting those metrics? And then we will be offering a, you know, like set of questions or a challenge for you that how can you use P4 language to uh, program the switch such that it can extract some metrics from the network, right? So uh, something that we covered in the lecture three, I believe, uh, which was on the RMT switches, which talks about the network telemetry, right? And it talks about that, uh, you know, like one of the attribute of these programmable switches is that it can extract a metadata information from the switch, right? So it can see that which set of switches a particular packet traversed and what was the uh, state of the switch at that time, right? So at what time the packet hit the switch, what was the size of the queue that it observed, right? So these are all the things that a packet can extract from the network. So this will be part of the programming assignment for you uh, that, you know, like in the context of uh, this programmable uh, topology that you have set up, uh, you will be, uh, you know, like able to play with that network, change the network conditions and see whether your, you know, P4 program is able to capture the metrics that we're interested in. And second, whether those metrics are reflecting the behavior uh, of the network given certain programmability that we're offering, right? So maybe we can change the bandwidth that is available for streaming videos, or we can run more videos and then that the metrics that you will be collecting will be reflecting how 
the behavior uh, is changing uh, based on you know like what like you know what type of network conditions these video streaming sessions are running on right at the same time we will be collecting the metrics from the video streams as well uh, which will help us quantify the quality of experience that you like any user will be watching these videos what will be the quality of experience for those users right so that that will be assignment one and assignment uh, two will be very very related to this one but in assignment one we are just focusing on monitoring but in assignment two based on the monitoring results that we have uh, we will be taking some actions so that we can improve the quality of experience for the user right so this will be a bit of a closed loop assignment uh, you don't have to invest in uh, learning multiple things uh, when you are working on these assignments like you know you will be developing a core set of expertise uh, around a spectrum of things that you can do with p4 switches uh, which is uh, you know like uh, enabling uh, flexible network telemetry and then uh, you know like enabling flexible network control so that you can close the loop and try to optimize for some network objectives right and this is something that you will uh, read uh, or learn in other lectures that we will be or the other topics that we will be covering in this class which is like you know how people have built uh, telemetry systems how people have built some control systems using the tools that you will be covering in the programming assignment right so the the examples of the uh, the topologies that we will be covering uh, in the programming assignment will be relatively uh, small scale uh, a bit toyish but at least it will give you an exposure to how will you go about uh, designing uh, like you know uh, topologies or experiments uh, if you want to pursue type of research that we will be covering or type of topics uh, system that we will be covering as part of this class right so i think like the end goal will be like you know i'll be very happy and uh, will mark success if uh, most of you are uh, you know like able to understand and comprehend the nuances of the p4 language and uh, you know like have confidence of building any type of uh, flexible network telemetry application using these targets right as well as you know the control programs leveraging these targets uh, you know like that is a very uh, valuable skill if anybody wants to go into the uh, you know like networking industry down the line i think like these are the skills that are highly highly valued in the industry and uh, very few people are equipped and trained in these things right so uh, that is that is my target uh, as i probably mentioned the first lecture as well uh, but i i'm hoping with these programming assignments uh, you will be proficient in the goals or the learning objectives that i have set here any questions concerns before we move forward So I think like before I start the lecture, I just have one final question. Any other challenges that you're facing uh, with the learning here, right? Is there, uh, are the lectures clear? Are the slides useful? Or like, you know, is there anything else that we can do to improve your experience here? Mm -hmm. So Matthew, you're saying that there's a whole lot of reading uh, to get through. So is, are, are you referring to the reading assignments that we have? Or you're referring to the lecture slides as much? Yes. Yeah, so I think uh, some of you are concerned that you have to read research papers uh, and it is a steep learning curve i don't deny that uh, you know but at the same time this is a skill that will be very very valuable for you uh, going down the line that uh, like one of the thing that i want to inculcate at the end of this class that you will have confidence that reading research papers is not really that hard right uh, if you have the right uh, basics uh, and like you know right understanding of different principles in place reading research papers will not be as hard and like you know i can understand and i totally understand and appreciate that you know when you are starting right now you, you will be finding this as a very very steep learning curve and you might think that you're not really getting or grasping everything that you think uh, or you know you like you know reading research papers is not exactly re reading the textbooks that you are used to in the past because you know like when you read a textbook it is expected that you understand everything right uh, i don't think that is the same standard that i want to set here but at the same time, as you will progress, you will have, you know, like this inherent confidence reading these research papers that you understand what the research papers are talking about. It resonates resonates with what we are teaching or covering in the lectures. Uh, so it's not going to 
you know like within first week or to second week i don't think uh, you know like it will be an easy experience reading research papers uh, but i think uh, this experience will improve and at the end of this uh, class my goal is that you know if anybody throws a research paper at your end you will be able to comprehend the key ideas in the paper right like you know as i mentioned the first lecture itself there are different stages in which one can read research papers you don't really have to read a research paper to an extent that you are able to replicate all everything that has been done in it right but being able to grasp what are the key ideas and how those key ideas map to the you know like common set of principles and abstractions that exist in the in the networking area i think that will help you a lot to understand and with whichever profession you choose to go i think like this ability of reading uh, papers in uh, networking and systems uh, will will go a long way for you right so that is my take and also i think like you know uh, in the next iteration of uh, research papers that i have listed a lot of these research papers are the ones that are experience papers that have been written by engineers at google and facebook and microsoft and other places right so i think uh, going forward uh given that this is a advanced networking class right it's not a basic networking class so the standard is definitely higher uh but at the same time i think like you know you will have a lot of confidence once you understand uh what has been covered in this research papers and we can also have a more uh you know like broader conversation around the questions or the things that were unclear in some of these research papers and then i can try to cover them uh in the lectures so that you know that like if there is a knowledge gap once you're done reading these papers we can you know like explore those common themes the onyx paper that was part of the last assignment i didn't get any feedback from students that it was too hard i think like i hope i, I my feeling was that students enjoyed reading it uh, yeah so yeah raymond has very good suggestion i think uh, that is absolutely correct uh, try don't try to read papers linearly right uh, don't try to read uh, line by line sentence by sentence Uh, that's not how you read research papers research papers should be read in a non linear way i have a reference for you in on the course website uh, by s keshav which talks about how to read a research paper i would highly highly recommend that you take a look at it uh, and i don't expect until unless you are implementing something like you know things that are uh, that you are going to replicate for the course project i don't expect that you go to the level of detail that you understand how you're going to replicate each and every result in the paper right that is too much to ask for but i think as raymond was pointing out that you know like uh, understanding the high level gist of the paper is uh, something uh, that will be very very helpful uh, in understanding the spectrum of research that has been done trying to map what you read in this paper in these papers with what you are learning in the lectures will be very, also very very helpful right and if you find any knowledge gaps that there are terms there are uh, you know like arguments in the paper that have not been covered in the lecture please bring them up and like you know i'll be more than happy to clarify those things for you and we have office hours for these as well right so feel free to post your questions on slack uh, but also like after the submission deadline of course but like you know uh, but also feel free to reach out to me come to me or the other teaching staff uh, during the office hours if you want to you know like dig deeper try to understand where the knowledge gaps are we are we are here to help you all right anything else All right so let's get started with today's lecture I'm assuming that you're able to see my screen please let me know if there is any problem uh seeing my slides right now Okay perfect All right so uh in today's lecture we will be talking about network virtualization and uh, this is a continuation to what we have been covering in this class so far uh, we started with the overview of software defined networking then we start we took a bottom up approach where we first started looking into the programmable data planes then we started looking into what uh, network operating systems are how they interact with the uh, programmable data planes and now we are in this lecture uh, we are going to focus on uh network virtualization uh like network virtualization is something that we when we were talking about software defined networking when we were talking about the abstractions uh, for software defined networking uh, we mentioned something called specification abstraction uh, which makes it easier uh, for programmers to you know like specify what exactly they want the network and you know like 
only focus on the portions of network that are of interest for them, right? So uh, network virtualization is one way of enabling that. So in today's lecture, we'll be, you know, like uh, trying to learn what exactly network virtualization means. Uh, what are the network virtualization requirements for multi-tenant data centers, right? So multi-tenant data centers, you know, for a quick reference, think about Amazon or Microsoft Azure. So these are multi, like good examples of multi-tenant data centers where, you know, like we, you know, I can, I can be a tenant and somebody else can also be a tenant. So we are all sharing the same sort of physical resources. So what, like, you know, uh, these, these data centers are providing different types of virtualization so that, you know, we have a seamless experience using those resources. So we will be exploring the network virtualization requirements uh, for these uh, multi-tenant data centers. And then we'll be exploring uh, the design and implementation of uh, network virtualization platform uh, that was developed by Nisira. And as I mentioned uh, in a couple of lectures ago, that uh, Nisira was one of the company that was founded uh, based on these software defined networking principles uh, by graduate student uh, at Stanford who worked with Nick McEwan, who was a faculty along with Scott Shanker, uh, who was a faculty at Berkeley. Uh, so Nisira was a company which was, you know, like uh, uh, identified these set of problems uh, from multi-tenant data center perspective, and they built this virtualization platform, which was uh, I don't think it it is as relevant these days. Uh, you know, I would I would cover in the lecture why, but it was a game changer when like you know in context of when it was developed. Right. So we will try to understand the design of this platform as well. So as we know that, you know, like abstraction is the key. I've been emphasizing that for a couple of lectures now. Uh, abstraction is the key to make computer systems what they are right now. Uh, we have really solid abstractions uh, in the existing uh, world. We have virtual memory where you have this abstraction of or illusion of infinite memory, physical memory that is privately available to you, right? Uh, similarly, we have file system where we can, you know, like have this illusion that we can read or write anything uh, in the data store without worrying about uh, where exactly it is going, how exactly it is going, right? Uh, similarly, with the virtual machine that we don't have to worry about the, uh, like, you know, how these uh, processes are sharing, how these resources are being shared. You have a virtual machine, you have an abstraction that you have this complete machine under your control and you can do whatever you want with it, right? So these are the abstractions that took a long time in the systems community to mature and come out but they were also a huge game changer, right? So in context of these abstractions, uh, what does network virtualization really mean, right? So in this context, uh, the abstraction or illusion here will be that you have access to a physical network in which the user or application uh, or possibly the administrator cannot tell if the network is physical or virtual, right? So you have physical network underlying, you know, there will always be some physical network, but on top of it, you provide an abstraction, which is giving you an illusion that you're actually working on a physical network, uh, but it is, you know, uh, decoupled from what a physical network is, right? So this, this terminology, this description might seem a bit confusing, but I think like, as we will cover, uh, you know, this uh, lecture in greater details, these, these uh, you know, uh, fogginess that we have around the terminology will get clearer, right? But think about it at a very high level, think about an abstraction or an illusion that when you're operating on a network as a user or as an administrator, you have no idea whether the network that you're working with is real, is physical or virtual, right? That is network virtualization. So of course, network virtualization is not a new idea. Uh, people have explored it in the past. Uh, I am sure some of you are aware of VPN and uh, VPN is an example or instantiation of network virtualization, which is not new at all. So uh, in VPN, you have a VPN client most, most times uh, in your laptops. And then, you know, like VPN client and servers are, you know, like using or creating a tunnel over the public internet. Uh, when you are browsing something, the IP datagram goes to the client, client just adds a tunnel header. And then you know, like, this tunnel header is the one which is taking care of taking this IP datagram packet from the client to the server. Uh, it does not follow the nuances of like, you know, the public internet. Uh, for public internet, it is just a tunnel traffic. Uh, it doesn't really care where it is coming from, where it is going, uh, or what is inside this IP datagram. It only looks at the tunnel header fields and then directs the packet to the VPN server, right? So the question is, uh, to what extent is this virtualization? What are we really virtualizing here, right? 
So, uh, you know, if you think about the abstractions or the terminologies that we have used so far, uh, this is technically virtualizing the data plane, right? So, uh, you know, like you don't really care about which set of routers a particular packet goes, you just care about what set of sources and destinations can talk to each other. And, uh, you know, like you're adding some header, tunnel header to it, and like, you know, abstracting away all the details about how this packet will go from point A to point B, right? So it is virtualization, but like say, for example, there is no virtualization here for the control plane, right? So uh, I cannot control, like I don't have a control of like, okay, enforcing some policies in the network where this traffic is going, right? So uh, like it's just providing a virtualization for the data plane. It's not really a full instantiation of the network virtualization that we expect in software defined networking. There were also attempts of network virtualization from uh, the perspective of uh, uh, the uh, like the software defined networking itself. Uh, the terminology that is referred here is called slicing. So what happens in slicing is that you have multiple controllers that are all trying to uh, you know write control programs for the same physical network, right? But the virtualization is enabled by uh, slicing the portions of network which the controller can program, right? So for example, uh, one controller uh, might be written, say for example, you know, like think about the UCSB campus network, and then uh, we have different departments and each of those departments, you know, want to uh, control this using programmatic abstractions, right? So uh, I can write a controller and provide this slicing, slicing in a way that it will, like the computer science controller can only affect or influence the traffic for computer science department traffic, right? So like that way I can slice the overall traffic that is coming in and out of that network based on the IP addresses and say like, okay, these IP addresses belong to computer science department. So computer science controller should only have access to read or write or you know, like influence the traffic that is coming in and out of these IP addresses, right? So this is one example of how network slicing can be enabled. Uh, in general, uh, for a network, there are always multiple stakeholders. So this was a very good idea, uh, which was instantiated uh, in the early days of software-defined networking. A system called Flowvisor is based upon this idea, and it leverages the fact that you know like you can have an arbitrary, like if you treat the flow space as a combination of multiple header fields, uh, you can like suppose you're considering 13 different header fields, which was part of the OpenFlow 1.0. So if you are uh, writing these match action rules based on these 13 header fields, so there are technically 13 dimensions around which or across which you can divide or slice a flow space, and each of those controllers can work on a different flow space, right? And uh, you know, of course, there will be issues about around the conflicts that the flow spaces, if they're overlapping with each other then who is responsible for writing on these overla uh, overlapping flow spaces, which controller has priority, which controller does not have priority. I think those type of issues will come in. Uh, these are very interesting research questions that were very, very fundamental to the design of uh, software defined networking controller from interdomain routing perspective, where, you know, like we have, like, you know, you probably know what interdomain routing is, but you have different administrative domains that are trying to interact with each other so that a, traffic from one domain can reach to some traffic or some server in a remote domain, right? So think about traffic going from UCSB to say Google, right? So YouTube, right? So YouTube is a different administrative domain. UCSB is a different administrative domain. So how exactly they interact with each other? Uh, what type of, you know, like uh, slicing is required there? Uh, how are we going to resolve the conflicts? These are very important research questions that were explored in a research called Software Defined Internet Exchanges or SDX. And this is something that we will cover in next to next lecture. Uh, and I was privileged enough to work on a project uh, on this topic where we built a system which was answering all these questions, right? So we will be covering uh, that system and we'll be covering about, like you'll be talking about the abstractions and the issues that one has to resolve uh, talking about these slicing of the network, right? So this is definitely a good attempt at network virtualization, but uh, you know, like it, it is still, uh, limited or less flexible in terms of how you are dividing the network, right? So you still, you cannot say create an arbitrary address space on top of what is an actual existing address space, right? So you're still working within the same uh, address space of the flow space. You're not transforming the existing uh, physical address space into some virtual address space so that, you know, you can operate on a completely different network, which is not real at all, right? So in some sense, 
I would say that the uh, slicing approach is just a partial instantiation of network virtualization, right? This is not full network virtualization. So what is full network virtualization? How we can enable is something that we will cover uh, later in this class. So oh, I covered that part, okay. So moving forward, uh, I think uh, this is a time, uh, 2007, 2006, uh, when data centers were just, you know, getting started. Uh, I mean, like they were data centers, but, uh, you know, Google was built around this idea of data centers and like their biggest strength when they started was that they had racks and racks of servers, like a lot of compute compared to all their peers. Uh, that was the secret of the success. But 2006 is, you know, six, seven uh, time is when, uh, you know, the like scalability of these devices become a real challenge, right? So uh, we covered uh, this topic briefly in the uh, lecture two, the, when we were talking about the intellectual history of software defined networking. But I think, you know, like we covered this aspect that, you know, if you are using these expensive uh, physical switches, which Cisco and Juniper were selling, that was an unsustainable, uh, you know, approach. So like, you know, uh, figuring out uh, ways in which uh, the data centers can be built using cheaper physical servers and switches was an idea that was heavily, heavily explored in 2010 timeframe, starting early 2000, you know, like 2010, by the end of 2010, we had a lot more maturity on how we can reduce the cost of building data centers, right? So in general, I think, you know, the first iteration of data centers were all about that you had physical uh, switches, you had physical servers, each of these uh, uh, servers were providing, you know, like computation uh, power to you. And then you like, you know, maybe for some distributed set of tasks, you were using multiple physical servers and you're combining the power of all these uh, different compute servers together to do really expensive computational tasks, right? But over time, I think, uh, you know, like uh, the, when, when this type of compute, uh, like, you know, Amazon started this trend, uh, when they were trying to sell this compute power to other customers, like other people who don't really have, uh, you know, like, who don't really want to invest uh, setting up this entire environment on their own because setting up these type of compute environments is expensive. So they were trying to amortize the cost uh, that they were, you know, like, so they built huge data centers that were relevant for Amazon, uh, but then they also became an expert of building those type of data centers. They were like, okay, why don't we sell this as a service? Uh, that's how Amazon Web Services kind of like, you know, uh, started. May, I'm, I'm oversimplifying their decision-making. I'm sure they like at the corporate level, there were more sophisticated uh, factors involved when they were making these decisions. But logically that is kind of like, you know, what it really uh, transcends to. And in the multi-tenant data centers, uh, one abstraction that came out was virtual machines, right? So virtual machines as an idea existed, but you know, like it caught up from the multi-tenant data center perspective that you can, you know, like sign up on their web portal and say like, okay, I want to use a VM. And then you're like in the background, a VM gets set up on a physical server. You don't care where, where that physical server lies as long as you're getting those, uh, you know, compute powers. But as this evolved, uh, you, you know, one VM was not enough for the computational task that you needed, right? So, you know, different type of uh, uh, tenants uh, had different types of requirements in terms of how many VMs they need and how these VMs are going to talk to each other, right? And that becomes very important. Uh, so, you know, initially this uh, provide, like, you know, these uh, multi tenant data centers focused on uh, virtualizing the compute power, right? But when, uh, like, you know, this uh, VM cannot be locate, localized on a single server, physical server. Then they also had to think about the uh, networking apps aspect or the networking virtualization of this problem, right? So if I'm setting up a new virtual machine on a different physical server, then as a customer, I should have the same abstraction that I'm having as if this VM is running locally on the same physical server, right? So that is why we need a network virtualization. And there can be different use cases, right? So the yellow lines that you see here, uh, all the yellow, like, yeah, you know, the color is basically representing a particular tenant. So yellow VMs are belonging to tenant one, greens are belonging to a different two, tenant two, blue ones are tenant three, right? So uh, in this case, the yellow tenant is interested in having this one physical switch or one uh, big switch abstraction where all these virtual machines are just, you know, uh, one hop away from each other, right? So they're just connected with a layer two switch, right? Uh, but of course, there's an underlying physical infrastructure in place. So how do you provide this abstraction that all these virtual machines are just directly connected by a physical switch is a challenge, right? And uh, this is kind of like motivating a case that, okay, tenant one have a different requirement in terms of what type of network connectivity they want for their set of VMs. 
the client the tenant two has a different networking requirement right they want to have like you know uh, layer three routing enabled and they want to uh, provide this routing functionality between different vms right so they don't want all these vms to share the same physical layer to network they want them to be on a, like you know use routing to reach from one host to the other right so different tenants have different requirements these vms uh, also need to seamlessly move from one part of the network to the other uh, without really requiring any overhead at the customer end right so this is kind of like the real need for network virtualization the computer computing virtualization was a game changer but i think like you know networking virtualization was becoming a bottleneck because every time you are changing or starting a new vm then as a tenant i was worried about that okay i have to configure the networking configuration of this vm such that uh, like i have to be physically aware of like which physical server it is mapped to and then uh, configure routing configuration on this vms myself right so this was this was a nightmare uh, for the tenants and there was a phase when this was actually a practice of how you can use or set up vms uh, or compute resources on these web services but network virtualization for mtds was something uh, which became a real use case and nisira was one of the company that was focusing on solving this problem so what type of uh, possible approaches can we take right so we learned about software defined networking in this class and very obvious thing is that why don't we just you know like replace these existing uh, server like ex existing switches uh with uh, you know like programmable switches and use the software defined networking principles that we've been talking about it should be so much easier to uh, use these programmable switches for that task right uh, but one thing to notice here is that you know we are talking about data center networks we're talking about an environment where people have already invested buying these switches right and uh, like of course all these switches have a you know like they come with an expiration date that they don't last for more than four or five years uh, in use but companies had already invested a lot of money buying these devices and they couldn't wait to you know uh, you know they couldn't afford to wait for four years for these devices to expire so that they can enable programmability in the network right so the approach that uh, made a lot of sense for them at that point of time was that okay we cannot change these expensive switches that are sitting inside our network or you know like that are providing the physical connectivity but we can definitely change the software switch that is running on these host machines right and as i mentioned when we were covering uh, the uh, the open v switch in lecture 3 that the open v switch was part of the nisira project right so the team uh, building the nisira uh, mvp was actually the one that was building this virtual switch because they realized that okay we cannot really change the switches in the network but we can change the switches at the edge or these end hosts right and provide the connectivity that we need and like you know offer uh, all sorts of flexibility because this is running in the cpo right uh, the uh, you know like the the, the the Nisira community kind of like decided that if we want this to be a success, we cannot keep this as a secret. So they decided to open source the OBS, and you know like that became a success story for software defined networking. Uh, because as you will see that you know like those ideas were uh, building blocks for uh, running any type of network virtualization or a network emulation on your laptops, right? So you learned about Mininet in the discussion section last week. Uh, and it talks about uh, this idea that how can you emulate any type of networking research prototypes on your laptop, right? So this OBS was key to it, and OBS was de designed for this goal of uh, enabling programmability or enabling network virtualization multi-tenant data center environment, right? So if I have to summarize the uh, network virtualization platform uh, in a nutshell, uh, it is arguing that you know you have these open V switch sitting at the end host. These are the switches that will be programmed using a network OS. Uh, the NVP was built on top of Onyx, right? So Onyx is something that we covered in the last class. And uh, it was improving Onyx that it was, you know, like only letting Onyx do very low level tasks. And then it adds a network virtualization platform or network virtualization layer at top of it. And then it provides an abstract view to individual customers or individual tenants uh, that are, you know, like running these different VMs on the network, right? So there are two abstractions that are very critical to uh, to network virtualization platform. One is the control abstraction. So in control abstraction, the key idea here is that the uh, the abstraction lets the tenant control the logical network elements as their physical ones, right? So uh, as we saw earlier, that you know uh, when you want, like you know, so the yellow line 
is actually one type of logical network, right? That is built on top of a physical network, right? Similarly, the set of green lines is another example of a different logical network that that tenant two wants on top of this physical network, right? So when we are offering this type of uh, logical network to the customers, they can write, they can build their own customers, or like they can they can use their controller to program this logical network as if it is real network, right? So they don't have to worry about the lower level details that are enabling this virtual abstraction on top of a physical network, right? So how, like whatever translation is required to, you know, like make sure that the packets are following uh, the path based on this virtual abstraction, the programs that you've written for the virtual network on the physical network, that translation is taken care of, like it's happening under the hood, right? So as a, as a, as a tenant, I'm not really exposed to all the nitty gritty, you know, translations that you're doing under the hood to make sure that packets from point A to point B can reach uh, with the, uh, like while applying the set of policies that I'm expressing for this virtual network, right? So that's one example of, uh, you know, the control abstraction. Uh, of course, like it also offered uh, the sequential modularity. Uh, what I mean with sequential modularity is that, you know, whatever logic or logical data path that you want to apply, on the packet, you can express that as a sequence of lookup or match action tables, right? So you can say, okay, I want, uh, you know, like apply uh, uh, ACL rules, right? Access control list. I want to match on certain set of uh, uh, rules and say like, you know, whether a packet needs to be dropped, it needs to be forwarded, right? I can apply certain set of policies uh, around uh, the, the prioritization of different flows and all those things, right? So I can express all that as a sequence of match action tables, right? So this is an abstraction uh, as part of the control abstraction that NVP is providing. And I'm highlighting this because uh, I would, uh, you know, you would appreciate when we cover or in the next lecture, when we are talking about the programming languages for software defined networking, I think uh, sequential, like enabling sequential modularity is relatively easy. But, you know, what is difficult is how can you compile or how can you, uh, like you know express programs and you know compile those programs that are requiring you to write programs or logics that have to be applied in parallel as sequence or combination of parallel and sequence right so that is hard and that requires a complete new grammar of how these programs can be expressed and how these programs can be compiled and that is something that we will be learning briefly like you know we will not be really uh, getting into the details of how exactly the compiler works but at least at the abstraction level we will understand uh, what those uh, principles really mean and what are what is the value of uh, having that type of abstraction for writing network control programs right so that is the control abstraction the other abstraction is the packet abstraction right so uh, like you know packet abstraction is very simple that it does like you know it should make sure that there are no changes required at the endpoints right so anything that i'm doing in the virtual machine should be completely agnostic to whatever business you're doing in the network right so whatever virtualization you're doing, whatever translation of packets you're doing, I should not be required to make any changes at my machine, like at my VM level or at my application level. Uh, and it, it should be completely agnostic to these things. So if I send a DNS traffic, it should follow the DNS, like, you know, packet which with the, the, the DNS protocol, it should be doing exactly that task, right? So uh, I should not be required to send an R packet to do a DNS task, right? So like that, protocol fidelity needs to be uh, satisfied so that I don't have to make any type of translation of changes at my application, right? So I don't need to change my application to make sure that I'm compliant with your network virtualization, right? So that is what packet abstraction means in this context. So the key enablers for MVP were hypervisors, service nodes, and gateway nodes, right? So hypervisor is something, as you can imagine, is sitting in on the host machine and it implements the tenant specific logical data paths, right? So as I said, logical data paths are sequence of lookup tables that you're trying to apply uh, on a particular packet, right? So it is implementing that logical path over the physical forwarding infrastructure. So it is responsible for doing the translation of the logical data path that you're expressing on your controller as a tenant to physical forwarding, uh, like that will be enabled using the physical infrastructure that we have, right? Like the, the physical machines, these the network interface cards, the physical switches that we have in the network, right? And then there are these two additional nodes that are part of the setup. One is called service node. So service node is, uh, you know, helpful for scaling the multicast and broadcast services. 
So, you know, like, I think like it is re relatively hard to understand and appreciate that without an example, uh, but uh, let's try, let's give it that a try. So if you're trying to send a multicast message, right? And if I'm like, you know, if I'm a VM, I'm trying to send a multicast message to all the VMs that belong to my, like, you know, that are part of my tenant, right? So think of the yellow VM. If one yellow VM is trying to send a broadcast message to all the other yellow VMs, right? So one approach is that the host, uh, like, you know, the host which is sending or the host where this VM resides is the one that is sending this broadcast message to all the other VMs, right? But then, you know, uh, that will mean that I'll have to provision uh, these hosts with such a high bandwidth that they are able to send, uh, you know, like these uh, broadcast messages to so many other VMs. And really think about there can be thousands and thousands of VMs uh, that might require this broadcast service, right? So that puts a constraint on me that I will have to provision high bandwidth for all the hosts that I have in the network, right? But rather than doing that, I can just send this type of uh, broadcast message encapsulated and send it to a service node. And then this service node is provisioned, like, you know, well provisioned only, I only have to like, you know, uh, provision service nodes so that they have high bandwidth and they can send the broadcast messages to other machines, right? So this is a difference. I think like, you know, whoever is sending the broadcast needs to have high bandwidth. So if I don't use any service nodes, then I have to provide this high bandwidth to all the hosts that I have in the network, right? But I can, I can, you know, counter that or I can bypass that by setting some dedicated service nodes whose job is to do this uh, broadcast or send this broadcast or multicast messages in the network. And they will help with the cost and the scalability of the system, right? Then we have the gateway nodes that, you know, like uh, if I'm a tenant uh, of say Amazon, and I might have some compute resources that are sitting on Amazon, and I might have some compute resources that are sitting on my own, own network, right? So think about UCSB, right? So at UCSB, I have a bunch of services running, and these services have to interact with the services that are running on AWS, right? So how can I, you know, like make sure that, like, you know, make this seamless such that I don't even, like, you know, when I'm writing any networking control programs, I don't even have to care about whether these, uh, you know, remote machines are sitting on AWS or whether they are, you know, like local to me here at UCSB, right? So uh, like gateway nodes are the ones that are providing this interconnection between the logical network that is there in, inside the data center network and the physical network that is outside, right? So, uh, you know, like we will try to see this example with this example, try to understand the job of the hypervisors as well as the gateways that, uh, you know, we have these two yellow VMs that are trying to talk to each other. We're trying to provide this uh, layer two abstraction that all these are, you know, like in one uh, like logical or subnet uh, that they can, you know, like they don't really need layer two or layer three routing, uh, like L2 is good enough. And like, you know, we are providing cell two abstraction for these virtual machines. So to enable that, uh, you know, the virtual switch at the physical machine two has to add these bunch of headers uh, on top of the packet before it releases. And then, you know, like this is technically like, you know, from physical machine, it will have the address, like, you know, it will add, like, you know, this hypervisor sit, sitting at the physical machine too will be responsible for doing all this translation, but we'll say like, okay, that like it is coming from physical machine two, it is going to physical machine 1.1, and then uh, it is coming from uh, virtual interface 0110, and it is supposed to go on virtual interface 0109, right? So this is the information that it will pack, and then uh, the hypervisor at the source will be packing this information, the hypervisor at the receiver will be unpacking it and sending the IP datagram to upstream VMs, right? So this is how we, uh, you know, like hypervisors are helping us realize these logical data paths over the physical network that exists in these data center networks, right? And we have the gateway network. So, you know, suppose there is a VM, which is uh, like, you know, blue tenant or the third tenant, 171, 64, 74, 155. So now within the same subnet, I want to talk to a machine that is sitting at Stanford. And maybe I should have replaced that image with the UCSB image, but you know, like, let's give them a credit. I've taken, uh, these slides from lecture of Nick McEwen. So uh, basically uh, I want to provide an illusion that both these VMs are sharing the same subnet, right? So slash 24 is the subnet, which means that, you know, like the last, uh, uh, like, you know, first 24 bits of this IP address space will be the same and the last eight bits will be different, right? So 155 and 160 is the most important thing. I want to provide an illusion that, you know, like for a VM which is sitting at Stanford, doesn't care whether uh, the VM sitting at AWS is the one uh, which is you know like on a different subnet number. I, I don't really want to care about the networking there. 
uh, or, or the routing there. I just assume that it's within my subnet. I should be able to reach out to it with very simple routing rules, right? So this can be enabled by one, the hypervisor adding these type of uh, uh, headers on top of the packet, but also a gateway, which is translating the virtual IP addresses into the actual destination IP addresses, right? So uh, like, you know, this translation is something which the gateway is going to enable such that uh, the traffic going out of the gateway is able to leverage the public internet and it is able to reach to the destinations where it is supposed to go, right? So as, as a tenant, I don't really have to worry about how I am going to how am I going to do this type of translation? This is all under the hood. This is part of the abstraction that the virtualization is providing, such that you don't really care uh, whether it is on the same physical network or it's on a different physical network. Right. All right. So we've been talking about uh, the logical forwarding that is being enabled at the hypervisor. So as I said, right, like the abstraction here is that the the controller that is uh, responsible for a particular VM is the one that is going to express the logical data path that a packet has to apply, right? So if it is going from a yellow VM, then what type of log, like you know, lookup tables should be applied on a particular packet, right? So that is the that is the program that the tenant is going to express, and then at the hypervisor, these logical data paths will be compiled on a physical data path, right? So uh, you know, like that translation will happen at the hypervisor. At the source hypervisor, most of these translations, most of this programming, or most of this, you know, like logical data path will be applied at the source as much as possible, right? And then once this uh, translation of logical uh, lookup tables to physical uh, set of rules that have to be applied is done at the source, then you will have uh, tunneling, right? So you will be using tunneling to send to a different physical host or a different hypervisor, and then that different hypervisor will be the one that is responsible for translating the packets back. To the datagram that the virtual machines can understand. Right? And as I said, like you know, most lookup tasks here will be performed at the source hypervisor. Uh, it it helps a lot with the programmability that we are you know like there is just one point where we have to program and we have to we are you know like we are applying all these policies before we are actually sending it on the physical network. So the network control uh, in this setup is proactive, right? So what is network control here, right? So the network control here is that, uh, you know, we are looking at all the uh, location information of where these hypervisors are and uh, what type of forwarding state uh, they write, they currently have. Uh, and then, you know, like, so they provide this location state, topology, everything. And uh, then the, the data center owner, like think about Amazon, uh, AWS person, like administrators, they configure the network, the topologies and the protocols that have to be supported. And then the, uh, the, the logical control planes are the ones that are, you know, like responsible for uh, calculating this forwarding pipeline for each of those, uh, like for each of the virtual switches that are sitting at these, uh, you know, like hypervisors or the physical servers. And then uh, it is translating them into the open flow or the OBS control protocol messages that will be sent to the uh, downstream devices, right? Uh, from terminology point of view, I think uh, some of, like at some points in the paper, if you read the paper at some points, you will see that uh, there's a term called transport nodes. So uh, transport nodes are basically hypervisors, gateway or service nodes that are enabling uh, the virtualization for uh, data center or multi-tenant data centers, right? So don't get confused when you see transport nodes. Transport nodes basically mean uh, these physical devices that are offering services as a hypervisor gateway or service nodes. Uh, the NVP is, uh, you know, like it is getting all this configuration information and then it is doing the proactive network control that it is computing uh, what should be the logical uh, pipeline, forwarding pipeline for each switch and then it is translating that into physical uh, set of rules that should be compiled on each of those devices and uses OpenFlow to, you know, configure these devices. Uh, it uses a tool called NLog or it, in, in general, it basically built a tool called NLog and NLog, uh, I, I don't think it's within the scope of this lecture that we go into the details of what NLog really is, uh, but at a high level, it's a declarative programming language, uh, which is inspired from uh, Datalog, I believe, is a software that is used in the database community, where you can express the data, like, you know, you can express these declarative joint programs of like how a particular uh, packeting, like, you know, processing pipeline should operate. So they kind of like, you know, adapted it in context of uh, the network control. 
and uh, i would say that it's not really very clean uh, even though the paper claims that it is very convenient and clean it is not really as clean from the abstraction perspective and the next uh, you know like lecture we will be covering pyretic and that is also a reading assignment for your folks so that actually uh, you know really provides very very clean abstractions in terms of how exactly this type of program should be written uh, you know, this is proactive uh, and proactive uh, meaning that you know it is uh, taking all the uh, input as information then you know proactively pushing the configuration to these devices it is not really reacting and this is a bit different uh, between uh, the control plane that is enabled in nvp compared to the control plane that is enabled in pyretech right so we will see those differences and you will be able to appreciate those differences in the next class so uh, we talked about the scalability challenge for controllers and as, as i mentioned earlier right when we say controllers you can think of the network operating system right so uh, control like scaling of controllers is as we discussed is a huge challenge uh, for these networks uh, so like the way uh, nvp adapts to this or addresses this problem is that it offers an api which the uh, you know like all these uh, tenants are using and then like the logical controllers are actually computing an abstract forwarding state right rather than computing a physical or or real uh, forwarding state which is you know very detailed about the open flow set of rules it is computing an abstract forwarding state and then it is translating this abstract forwarding state into an actual forwarding state right so it is doing it in a two uh, you know like two level hierarchy uh, which basically makes the computations relatively easier that you don't really have to worry about the low level details uh, for the forwarding state and you can you know like refer to the abstract state and then when you are translating that then your your focus is completely localized that you only have to focus on translating an individual abstract element network element uh, into the forwarding state right so that helps with the scalability and as i said like you know transport nodes don't get confused these transport nodes are basically the hypervisors the gateways and service nodes right so it is then computing the physical flow the physical configuration or actual configuration for each of those devices so this hierarchical design definitely helps a lot with reducing the complexity that the logical controller does not really need to worry about the low level details uh, the configuration details for the transport nodes the physical controllers are the ones that are providing this translation for them right so logical controllers you can any day replace a physical controller if you're changing the set of devices that you want to want to program like you know you maybe you want to change open flow like change from one version of open flow to the other or completely change using open flow so in that case you only have to update the physical controllers the logical controllers will still remain the same so this brings to the end of our lecture today uh, in terms of takeaways uh, you know like network virtualization is related to the sdn's uh, specification abstraction uh, network virtualization is was a killer application for software defined networking because you know uh, software defined networking uh, is a very good idea but ideas are only successful when there is a you know resonance between the requirements and the new ideas that you are pushing so you know like there is this in a, in a, like you know innovation push and technological pull that is going on that is when the success happens so you know network virtualization provided a use case which was you know sitting out there uh, it was a billion dollar problem for a lot of people and then software defined networking like this network virtualization kind of like you know provided the application of software defined networking and you know it changed the way uh, networking really works and operates uh, in a good way right like so now we are not really uh, training network engineers who should be masters of complexity right so they don't really have to learn tens of protocols they don't have to learn all the nuances of how different protocols work with each other how these distributed protocols are going to work in unreliable environment right so all those conventional networking uh, problems have been replaced with software engineering problems now because we have softwareized like you know the networking control uh, which is a good thing because we know how to solve them right so solving distributed uh, systems problems is much much harder than solving uh, scalability challenges for uh, you know centralized logical controller right uh, nisira's nvp is an instantiation of network virtualization and it was specifically designed for multi tenant data centers uh, nisira uh maybe i mentioned this earlier was acquired by vmware so whatever technologies they develop is kind of like owned by vmware and i guess that explains uh, you know that kind of like is one of the key offering that they have uh, as a product i'm sure they have a lot of other offerings as well but i think you know like they they acquired nisira and they also acquired or like got all the other engineers who were responsible for building it so uh, vmware is uh, is a heavy contributor 
in the open source community for software defined networking as well. So I think like, you know, one <laughs> like set of places where you can look for jobs once you have taken this course, uh, VMware, Microsoft, or Microsoft, uh, Azure, specifically AWS, these are the places which are looking for engineers who have expertise uh, on these programmable networks. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, you know, programmable network is a relative, like, you know, it has going on for decade, but uh, the, the number of engineers who have expertise on these topics is still very, very related, like limited because teaching these topics is very, very hard, right? So, uh, you know, like as a backstory, I also want to tell you that, uh, you know, there was a time uh, in 2012, 2013, uh, when this was becoming very, very real. That was also a time when Google released this paper called B4, which we will be covering in this class, uh, which gave an impression that, you know, like everything in the future about networking is going to be about software defined networking. And that was very troubling for people who have already invested tens or 15s of years being a network engineer. They didn't know what network programming is, but they knew how these protocols work. They were, they were basically the masters of complexity, right? And it kind of like created an environment where a lot of network engineers were very, very stressed, right? Because uh, the companies were looking for skill set that they didn't have. And, uh, you know, like their, their skill set was a bit outdated and, uh, was really hard to apply in this new environment, right? Like you like to succeed in this environment, you have to be good with software, software engineering uh, basics, right? So that was a tough time. Uh, at that time, uh, you know, we created this course called software defined, like just software defined networking uh, for Coursera, right? And uh, I think when we launched in 2013, 2014, it was one of the most successful course for Coursera, uh, like apart from the machine learning AI part, which is definitely more successful. Uh, and I think like, you know, we were surprised to see that the participants in that course were not really students. Uh, they were, most of them were actually network engineers, right? And uh, we, we got uh, good traction for that course, but we also got a lot of, uh, you know, heartfelt thanks for uh, the network engineers who were trying to adapt to this new environment, right? And the courses or the, the lectures that we were offering, the programming assignments that we were offering were enabling them to get some hands-on experience. Like they, like they didn't become software engineer overnight, but they were better programmers and like, you know, they had a better perspective about what software defined, defined networks really mean and how they can adapt in their environments. So we had people uh, taking these courses who were working at Cisco, Juniper, AT&T, Microsoft, you know, like, so the, the network engineers who were running these networks were like, you know, all of a sudden very worried uh, that can they, you know, adapt to this really uh, shift, titanic shift in the networking world. Uh, we were able to, you know, like uh, to some extent, I, I won't say that, you know, we completely, you know, we were, we were the only force out there, but I think like, you know, because it was free. So we definitely were, <laughs> you know, like the cheaper options available for a lot of people. And uh, so I think like, you know, the point that I'm trying to make uh, is that uh, with this course, I'm hoping, that uh, from UCSB, we will have more graduates who have really good understanding and insights about how these software defined networking, uh, what these software defined networking principles are, how they have been instantiated, uh, because there is definitely a huge, huge gap in terms of requirements for these companies. Uh, you talk, you think about any uh, content provider, cloud service provider company, everybody is using programmable switches in the network, right? But finding engineers who are expert on these top, type of topics is relatively hard, right? So I'm hopeful uh, that, you know, like this course will provide you opportunities to learn things that are relatively uh, hard to acquire. All right. So any questions before we leave? I think we are right on time here. Oops, what's happening? All right, I think I can end the recording as well.